I'm Denny Zane. I'm executive director of Move LA. Those of you who don't know Move LA, we're probably best known for our successful efforts to get um, ballot measures on the ballot in LA County for transit um, and uh, affordable housing. Measure R and Measure M were our victories for transit. Thank you, LA Metro. Thank you, LA County voters. And then uh, Measure H was a uh, measure in LA County to raise money to provide services and help to the homeless. But voters also approved. We are, I think, uh, congenitally uh, tied to the idea of ballot measure efforts. And the, and the reason for that is there are things in our community that just cannot be dealt with without major, major public investments. And if you need to do something significant, really with public investments, then um, you need to be thinking about the ballot measure um, in California. Um, and for those of you at a local level, recent court rulings have made uh, ballot uh, ballots that are qualified by voter initiative on a local level no longer two thirds, but rather majority vote opportunities. So that really, I think, is a uh, big opportunity for, for successfully moving forward an agenda that requires public investment. Today, we're gonna to talk a lot about diesel technologies. And we're gonna talk about that because diesel technologies ranks right up there at the top of our most uh, problematic air pollutants, but also because Diesel technologies are a very, very significant contributor to um, our, our climate challenges. But we want to focus initially, I think, on the public health issues related to diesel. Diesel is pretty ubiquitous. We all know trucks. But there's a whole wide range of trucks from small to very, very large. And they operate and provide a wide variety of roles and services for us. Um, I think as we think of this, we should appreciate that the technologies that diesel powers um, really are important to our lives. And while we may be thinking these days about uh, how do we get ourselves weaned off diesel, we should appreciate that the goods movement industry and other industries that rely upon that technology provide an important service. We need to maintain that service while we advance beyond the technology. So today I want to first start, I think, with um, uh, Marissa um, Garcia, who actually is a, a uh, member of the Move LA staff um, and uh, lives now in Whittier, grew up and spent much of her uh, early adult life in Santa Fe Springs. And um, Marissa here is offer, here to offer is essentially a kind of personal testimonial about her experience uh, with diesel exhaust. So Marissa, uh, share, what do you think? What's, what do you have to offer here for us today? Well, good morning, everybody. As Denny mentioned, my name is Marissa Garcia. I'd like to talk a bit about my personal experience in dealing with the health impacts of air quality. I grew up in LA County, less than a mile from two major freeways. Due to its proximity to the freeway, the community that I grew up in, and a community in which my mother still lives and where my three-year-old niece, Leia, regularly plays, is in the 80th percentile for diesel particulate matter. This means that for most of my life, I was exposed to diesel particulate matter at a rate higher than 80% of other communities in California. I've also had asthma for as long as I can remember. It's my belief that my asthma diagnosis is a direct result of the area the area in which I was raised, or more specifically, from breathing the polluted air with diesel exhaust in the area in which I was raised. Being asthmatic affects my life daily and has many costs associated with it. The most obvious cost is the cost of the medication necessary to breathe. One of my inhalers, which I'm never without, retails for over $200 for a three-day supply. That's over $2,400 annually, just one of the multiple medications I'm currently prescribed to treat and manage my asthma. Not to mention the cost of doctor and hospital visits. I'm fortunate to have good health insurance, which covers most of the costs, 
However, for many who are not as fortunate as I am, who struggle to pay for this life-saving medication, make no mistake, for many low-income individuals who are statistically more likely not only to be asthmatic, who also experience more frequent symptoms resulting in hospital visits, having asthma creates a significant financial burden. Other costs of asthma are not as obvious, such as having to miss work or family events due to asthma issues. When I suffer from an asthma attack, treatment which helps me breathe also makes it nearly impossible to sleep, which is a problem if the attack occurs at night and I have responsibilities the next morning. After an asthma attack, it often takes me days to recover and leaves me super fatigued, which makes it difficult to get anything done. Almost every time that I get sick, it causes issues with my lungs. I average about one to two cases of bronchitis every year. For me, my asthma means that catching a cold, the flu, or even experiencing allergy issues comes with an added risk of complications. Asthma limits your ability to do certain things because they can trigger asthma attacks. Physical activity can trigger my asthma, so I must be careful and take my inhaler prior to doing some physical activities to hopefully prevent asthma issues. Even laughing too hard can trigger asthma issues for me. Something as simple as walking outside on a cold morning can also trigger my asthma since cold air is one of my triggers. Hot days do not offer much relief, as those tend to be days with poor air quality. On days like that, I lock myself indoors with my air purifier on high and my fingers crossed that I don't suffer an asthma attack by simply breathing the air around me. This may seem extreme to those who do not have a chronic lung disease, but to me and to many others in our community, it's just what needs to be done to try to stay healthy. Because let's face it, those of us who know what it feels like to not be able to breathe know that it can be terrifying and we will do anything in our power to avoid anything that might trigger further lung issues. Although that is easier said than done when you live or work in close proximity to a freeway like the area that I grew up in and spent much of my life in. I'm sharing this to give you some insight of what it's like to live with asthma and the real cost of poor air quality to members of our community especially those who live near goods movement corridors where diesel powered heavy duty trucks are the norm. While many of us know that diesel exhaust contributes to air pollution, we may not realize that diesel exhaust is also classified as carcinogenic to humans based on evidence that it's linked to an increased risk of lung cancer. Diesel particulate matter has a significant impact on the ability to breathe and it can lead to the development of asthma in children and COPD and pulmonary fibrosis in adults. Highest level of exposure to diesel exhaust is experienced by those in our community who live near the ports, rail yards, and freeways, which tend to be lower income communities. Reducing our dependence on diesel is not only an urgent public health issue, but also an important tool in helping to fight climate change. Diesel trucks emitting high levels of diesel exhaust are a major source of air pollution, greenhouse gases, and diesel particulate matter. Transitioning from diesel to cleaner alternatives would prevent diesel trucks from necessarily polluting our communities and save thousands of lives and prevent thousands of hospitalizations and ER visits. We need to do what we can to improve not only the air quality, but also the quality of life of those in our community especially those who, like myself, struggle to do something that most people take for granted, which is simply to be able to breathe. Thank you. Marissa, thank you very much. Um, I, found, I found that very uh, moving. I don't think people who don't have asthma appreciate um, what an overwhelming experience it can be. Um, you said something about hospitalization. Is that in fact, something that happens to you uh, from time to time? Unfortunately, I've never been hospitalized, but I've had many visits to the emergency room, um, particularly before I was able to afford my own nebulizer, to give myself breathing treatments at home. Um, anytime I needed treatment um, beyond what my inhaler could provide, I would have to go to the ER um, and wait for hours um, 
you know, to get treatment and, and pay a co-payment of hundreds of dollars. And so when, when the pandemic, the COVID pandemic um, occurred, how did, how did you experience that? Um, I experienced that pretty much locked in my apartment alone because, you know, I, anytime I even get a cold, I have lung issues. So the thought of my lungs being infected with COVID was terrifying and I just really shut my life down. Um, very fortunate that I have a supportive family. Uh, my little brother, John, actually did my grocery shopping for about a year and would just, you know, come leave them at my doorstep. Uh, but that really affected um, my ability to have a normal life. Right. I can remember when last time I think that we and Move LA met at our offices was more than a year ago, like February, I think, mm -hmm. in, the fe in the February, beginning of March. And so that whole year, you were largely confined indoors. Yep. Um, because of your of you feeling your special uh, vulnerability to uh, lung complications of COVID. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I'm I'm really very happy to see that you you look fine. Um, you're, you're obviously not having an attack now. You're doing quite well. And I, I want to, I want you to know that uh, uh, you you're, you're very effective on television. Mm -hmm. If that's what this is, if that's what this is, if this is television. So thank you so much, uh, Marissa. We're going to move, I think, then to there are organizations around um, California that have made um, it long their mission to try to remedy the conditions that create such burdens for people like Marissa. One of those organizations is the Coalition for Clean Air. Now, the Coalition for Clean Air, Chris Chavez, where are you, Chris? Okay. I'm here. Chris, um, there you are. Oh, by the way, uh, Marissa, if you're able to, I think Fran Pavley just texted me and asked for a link to the, uh, do you have Fran's email that you can send her a link? Yes, I'll send it to her. When Senator Pavley calls, we respond. Because she, after all, is the, really the queen of climate fighters. <laughs> but, all right, so um, yes, um, the Coalition for Clean Air, am I right? You all just had a 50th anniversary? That is correct. Uh, Coalition for Clean Air was founded in 1971. 1971, my goodness. So we had air pollution problems back then, didn't we? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems to be a long persistent issue in this region. Yeah, I actually remember I was uh, in college at Occidental College, um, graduating in 1969. And I had grown up in the Inland Empire, um, a little town, Colton. Um, and I remember very well how bad the air quality got um, where we were routinely shuffled off to tennis courts or basketball courts um, and, uh, you know, told to get into the gym and in the showers and away from the air pollutants. Um, we thought it came from L.A. <laughs> Little did we know that we were generating plenty of our own. Um, I actually, 25 years ago, was the executive director of the Coalition for Clean Air. So I have some connection to this um, marvelous organization has played such an important role in helping us to clean up our air. Chris, um, I want you to tell us something about the mission. And I think you sent me uh, some slides that I will bring up. Are you able to bring it up or do you want me to bring it up? Uh, if you don't mind bringing it up. Let's see. Right there. Just putting up the, the picture of Denny Zane right there <laughs> as executive director of Coalition for Clean Air some uh, 40 years ago on the far right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and there is Ed Bagley Jr. here. This is celebrating um, a successfully convincing LA Metro to change from diesel buses to natural gas buses which in those days was regarded as a big, um, big uh, victory. Let's, um, I'm gonna, sh 
So I have to stop you from sharing so I can share. Um, and just, I, as, just a side note, uh, Ed Bagley Jr. is still on our board of directors, so. There is nobody on this planet who works so hard, as hard for clean air for so long as Ed Bagley Jr. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go to full screen here with this. All right, so Great. this this looks familiar yet unfamiliar. Chris, where are we? Yes, so this is uh, the Long Beach region. I actually uh, was pretty much born and raised in Long Beach as well. Currently live there. Uh, it's uh, you know looking at the the port and what a lot of people in our space may know, but t t uh, generally speaking, may not be as aware of, is that the port, both the ports of Los Angeles and the ports of Long Beach together. Are the large are the uh, the bulk of imports into the United States goes to those two ports, and uh, a, a significant share, close to 40, 30 to forty percent. Uh, so, but on the flip side of that, that means we get all the emissions uh, from moving those goods from the ports to the Inland Empire, uh, where the a lot of the warehouses are. There are also warehouses in the harbor area. You also have rail uh, emissions coming from that, as well as all the uh, cargo handling equipment. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, much of the air pollution, while much of the economic activity is, is owed to the ports, a lot of the air pollution is also uh, directly attributed uh, to operations coming to or from the ports. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide, Denny. All right. So as any know, Coalition for Clean Air, where we were found in 1971, and our mission is to protect public health, improve air quality, and prevent climate change. And really, the nexus of all three of those comes down to diesel exhaust. So diesel exhaust is actually the predominant toxic air contaminant in California's air. And those DPM concentrations are highest in communities near uh, goods movement facilities and corridors. So for example, in the Wilmington, Carson and West Long Beach community for AB 617, the amount of diesel exhaust is higher, or diesel particulate matter is higher than the South Coast Basin. And the South Coast Basin's diesel amounts are actually higher than the, uh, are, are, are already elevated. Uh, most of these communities are communities of color and low income. DPM is actually comprised of 40 different carcinogenic substances. And in doing research and reading of it, many of these substances are readily absorbed into carbon, into the carbon soot, which is then breathed into our lungs. Obviously, we don't want soot in our lungs, but much less soot that's absorbed all these toxins. Uh, there are many, many serious health effects uh, uh, stemming from diesel particulate matter. Uh, this is list some of them, uh, but certainly uh, a lot of these uh, things are experienced on a daily basis in uh, to people who live near these uh, sources. Uh, next slide. So, Chris, just be, before we move on, um, so it's no longer. We used to think when I was living in Colton or when I was at college in Los Angeles at Occidental College, mm -hmm. we thought it was car exhaust or air pollution from cars was the big problem, but you're saying it's not? Well, certainly everything contributes to the problem, uh, but in general, the transportation sector is the biggest source of emissions in California, both in terms of greenhouse gases, but also smog forming pollutants. And I would also, uh, uh, the transportation sector, both in terms of off-road sources and on-road sources, is the biggest source of diesel particulates. Uh, what we're also seeing and when it comes to diesel, our backup generators, uh, especially during the, the uh, public safety shutoffs uh, that we've seen in other parts of the state, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of diesel generators being deployed during that time. Uh, so, uh, but certainly transportation is the leading source and heavy duty in particular, which is primarily diesel based is, uh, is its major, major factor in that. Okay, um, I have another question, but I'll go to your next slide in case it answers it. Okay. Oh, there we go. So according to the California Air Resources Board, diesel exhaust contributes to 730 premature deaths from heart attacks and other cardiopulmonary health impacts, 160 hospitalizations, 
370 emergency room visits for asthma, and 520 cancers per million residents. Uh, and Diesel DPM is responsible for about 70% of the total known cancer risk from air toxics in the South Coast Air Basin. And to be honest, I've actually, you know, for me and, and uh, Marissa, when she was going through her history, that really resonated with me because I had asthma as a kid too. And I lived really close downwind of the 710 as well as the 405 freeways. So certainly that's had a personal impact on me. Fortunately, I, I haven't had a an asthmatic episode in a long, long time. But my cousin, who also lived in the same community, uh, actually still relies heavily on a rescue inhaler. Uh, so certainly there's been a personal impact there. I actually had been hospitalized younger for, for asthma. And so it's, uh, like I said, there's, there's a very strong connection for me personally to that. And uh, Denny, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there's also a, uh, other pollutants as well. So black carbon is a powerful short-lived climate pollutant. And also uh, diesel exhaust is the number one source of NOx, which helps form smog. So when we say smog, like you said there, we're talking about what they call ozone, tropospheric ozone. Correct, correct. So ozone high up in the atmosphere is a great thing. We want it there. But when it is down in our area, when it's down in the area where we breathe at, uh, it actually causes uh, lung irritation. Uh, and inflammation, uh, which is, uh, you know, very problematic uh, when you're trying to breathe. All right. So now that ozone is also one of these things called short-lived climate pollutants. Mm -hmm. There's a, I guess there's a nickname for these. They're called super pollutants. Mm -hmm. And they're called super pollutants because they are among the most powerful climate forcing uh, emissions, right? Correct. Correct. All right, so diesel, let me get so diesel exhaust and especially the particulate matters and the toxics. I guess the toxics sort of stick to the particulate matter, and that's how they get inside our lung, right? Right, and there, you know, there are also some gaseous based uh, toxins as well, but certainly uh, the, the bulk of the concern is what's being absorbed into the particulates. All right, so. Um, I've heard diesel as a cancer risk compared to cigarette smoke. But where on the list of, um, of you know, cancer causing uh, emissions or smoke does diesel stand, let's say, compared to, it's not as bad as cigarette smoke, is it? I hope no, not. I, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure on the, the comparison, but I'll, all I can say is uh, certainly I, I would not want to breathe either. I think I've read that uh, cigarette smoke is number one, the diesel exhaust is number two, in the cancer causing, lung cancer causing. Um, and I think we'll discover it's one of the big time climate forces also. Uh, so this just is a kind of shows uh, the consequences of diesel exhaust. So this is actually from the city of Long Beach and their, their uh, health uh, the health needs assessment in the city. And so the lifespan in Western Long Beach, which is actually the, the area that I live in, uh, is about is up to is several years shorter, up to eight years shorter than the east side, uh, which is less impacted by uh, goods movement and diesel. Uh, residents of the west and north side have a higher risk of cancer and asthma because you have the 710 freeway running along both of those communities. And then you, in the north end, you have the 91 freeway as well. You do have another freeway, the 605 on the east side, but the bulk of the truck traffic, the bulk of the diesel traffic is on that western side. And again, uh, West Long Beach, Carson and Wilmington have elevated asthma, cardiovascular and low birth rate weights. Uh, and that's, uh, that information is from the uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District. Uh, next slide. And so this just shows that this burden is not shared equally. You know, the impact is heaviest on the, uh, the Black and African American community. Uh, but also when you look at uh, socioeconomic factors, the shortest lifespan is also the, air, is the area that has a zip code that has the lowest median income. So again, it's showing that communities of color are the ones that are primarily impacted by this, as well as the low income communities. And next slide. 
Oops. And that's it. So certainly there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but uh, diesel is a major, major problem uh, for our air. So Chris, um, what does the Coalition for Clean Air think then is the number one um, the number one strategy for remedying um, this problem? Well, I think what's important to remember is that there's no silver bullet uh, in the sense of what's going to be able to reduce emissions. Uh, one of the biggest issues is, uh, yes, we need to make sure that incentives are out there to help facilitate the replacement of, uh, of diesel-based trucks. But we also need to make sure that we have the rules and regulations in place to, uh, to push forward that change. Uh, because ultimately, uh, it is going to take both a carrot and a stick approach in order to uh, require and, and have our goods movement sector evolve to a point where we're using low and eventually uh, zero emission trucks. So um, we've heard a lot lately about about alternatives to diesel. What are the alternatives to diesel that we might promote, encourage, facilitate, that work? So currently, right now, uh, the, the commercially available option are near zero emission trucks. Uh, there are electric trucks that are coming down the pipeline that will be commercially available within a few years. Uh, what we need to do now certainly is deploy, you know, deploy what we can immediately, but at the same time, building out the infrastructure and building out the support network for those zero emission trucks. So making sure that when those trucks are ready for prime time, when they are being used by the uh, goods, you know, uh, by the uh, goods movement industry, that the the network there, the charging network, these uh, support systems are there, uh, so that these trucks are not left stranded. That these trucks actually are able to function uh, correctly and and, and support uh, the needs that they're uh, they're fulfilling. So certainly, uh, you know, that we need to make sure that we're using, uh, we're we're doing, we're taking steps to clean the air now, but also building in for that future uh, once these, uh, that zero emissions future. Okay, so you use the expression near zero. Um, what, is, that a, is that near zero diesel vehicle? What is that? So that near zero is prim primarily refers to NOx emissions, uh, the, uh, the uh, oxides of nitrogen, uh, and the US EPA and CARB have a standard uh, for what that definition means. Uh, the you know, diesel particulates would, uh, would also be addressed in that since it's not a diesel based engine. Uh, you know, there are other pollutants that, that sure, are related I'll, I'll to it, but at the end of the day, from, uh, ultimately, uh, it, with the right te you know, um, technologies and so standards, we've just been sort of those, um, talking our congressional. Hang on, hang on a minute, Eli. Yeah. Like we can hear you and you're coming on the screen. Just muted him. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that ultimately, uh, you know, if, if uh, meeting the right standards, those trucks can be uh, significantly cleaner, 90% uh, cleaner. Uh, than and what fuels do they, do they use? So many of those trucks use, well, the natural gas trucks obviously use natural gas, but even within natural gas, there are different types of natural gas. There's uh, compressed natural gas, which, uh, but there's also renewable natural gas as well, uh, which comes you know, from uh, renewable sources. A lot of times that uh, uh, could be refuse, that could be uh, you know, other sources that are not necessarily petroleum de derived. All right, so that's like natural gas, like what we use in our stoves, typically. Correct. Although that mainline municipal natural gas uh, uh, that, you know, I, I don't know the exact breakdown of what, of the, how that's derived, but that is correct. That's basically the same thing. A lot of it's methane based. So that's the best available right now. But zero is coming soon. Commercially, yeah, it's certainly the, that's what's available at the moment. Um, again, uh, electric trucks should be, uh, are, are really close on the horizon as well. Uh, there is also a price differential issue where uh, electric trucks are more expensive, natural gas vehicles are, are more expensive than diesel. Uh, but certainly as the technology matures and becomes more widely deplo uh, deployed, 
uh, there's going to be, uh, the, the, that technology is going to become more affordable. All right, so um, I think now we'll move on to Mark. Hi. Mark. Uh, yeah. Mark Carroll. So you're the president and CEO, am I right, about at uh, um, East SoCal? I am. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. Um, and you have formerly previously worked at the South Coast Air District as well, am I right? Yes, I um, I worked there for eight and a half years, uh, and that has given me a greater understanding of the technologies and the impacts of air pollution, uh, the technologies that can be used to uh, address it. Um, but you know what, Breeze Southern California does is not only look at air pollution, we also focus on lung health and see air pollution as one of the causes of lung health. Um, you know, you talked about, I don't wanna compare. We, you talked about Coast for Cleaner being around for 50 years. We've been around since 1903. Are you and kidding? <clears throat> we started in, so in LA as focusing on tuberculosis and we were very involved in the 40s, 50s and 60s um, on the air pollution issue. And then, of course, uh, the Surgeon General in the 60s um, declared that tobacco was, cigarette smoking was a, um, you know, cause, was a carcinogen and caused cancer. So um, that was also another issue with us. And when you talked to Chris about uh, the distinction or the comparison of uh, cigarette smoking and tobacco to air pollution, um, one of the things, uh, it, it's, it's a very common comparison. Um, <clears throat> they cause a lot of the same diseases, um, cause health impacts uh, on the lungs especially. And um, while both are being addressed to try to reduce them, um, air pollution it's estimated plays a part in the death of about 8 million people worldwide, which is more than the number of deaths from tobacco. Um, and when you look at tobacco, uh, the, the main difference is tobacco is avoidable. Air pollution is not avoidable. And air pollution in the average person um, all across America, the average person, and so this doesn't account for California, which is greater, but the average person is exposed to the equivalent of one third of a cigarette per day. Uh, in LA, we have among the highest um, pollution exposure. And so we're close, it depends obviously on the day, but two to two uh, cigarettes, one to two cigarettes. And so um, it adds up and over one year period that one third of a cigarette for most Americans is equivalent to a hundred cigarettes a year or a thousand cigarettes in 10 years. And um, that's pretty damaging when, you know, if you could choose to spend your money on smoking a cigarette, we've convinced a lot of people uh, to reduce their tobacco use, to cut down on cigarette use. We can't convince people to cut down on their air pollution inhalation because you don't control what you, what you breathe. And so what we've got to do is protect public health and protect the health, particularly of sensitive uh, folks, the, the elderly population, people with, um, with uh, all pre-existing conditions and children especially, and address the air pollution problem from a, um, a public responsibility um, because individuals can't, can't address it themselves. Um, but we have a lot of challenges, clearly. You know this, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, not the technology because we know the technology is there. We know what the technology can do. And if we can get rid of um, the polluting vehicles particularly and, and other polluting equipment, we can um, reduce pollution. So it comes down to uh, getting the new technologies into uh, replacing the old technologies and that takes money and that takes political will. And that's really the challenge that we have. Um, if we don't have that political will, then you know people are gonna continue to breathe uh, air pollution uh, for a long, long time. Uh, and as Chris and um, 
Chris mentioned about diesel, and as you talked about diesel, diesel is the, the largest source of pollution in the region. And we know that we can replace diesel with cleaner uh, sources uh, of cleaner engines, and we know we have to. Uh, diesel is a significant cause, uh, as Marissa said, of um, public health impacts, uh, cardiovascular, uh, respiratory, uh, and so many other impacts, uh, not only asthma. And I know uh, when I was listening to what Marissa was saying, uh, it was very familiar to me because I have three kids with asthma. So as a parent dealing with their asthma attacks and understanding, um, trying to understand their triggers is, is critical. And I know that when we go to places like just the LA Zoo, which uh, uh, is adjacent to the five freeway or other places that are near freeways, uh, then we have a problem. And a lot of kids don't have the ability to avoid uh, those locations. People who live in homes near freeways or people who go to uh, daycare centers uh, or schools right near freeways. And there's uh, thousands of them across California, uh, particularly in Southern California, um, that people don't even recognize there's this invisible um, invisible ribbon of, to of toxics, uh, pollution that envelops those, um, those freeways. And if you're close enough, and most uh, uh, of us don't understand how close that can be, um, then you know, you're inhaling it without even knowing it. So, <clears throat> So what I'm hearing from Chris and from you, if I get it right, that diesel emissions are the worst. Are they also the most? I mean, is, uh, is diesel, it... well, you know, you're going to have to talk to Matt about the numbers, but I believe that according to AQMD, the diesel emission, uh, diesel uh, trucks are the largest individual source of pollution in the region. There are many the, other. There are many the diesel other, trucks and, and diesel uh, vehicles. All right. So there are other other things besides trucks that diesel powers. Like what? You've got construction equipment. You've got loading equipment. You've got, um, uh, well, trains. Yep. Locomotive you've got marine vessels. Marine vessels. Uh huh. Uh, now marine, marine vessels. vessels. I thought, uh, and we we have Madeline here talking about that. But marine vessels aren't. They're powered by. Um, uh, bunker fuel. I mean, the shipping, the, the over this ocean shipping is bunker fuel. Do you know, is bunker fuel worse, better than diesel? Well, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't bunker fuel like the the sludge that comes <laughs> from the production of diesel? Yeah, but I believe ARB has regulations that are now are requiring cleaner sulfur in the in marine vessels if it's within a certain uh, nautical miles of the coast. So All right, they're, so, they're trying to clean it up, but clearly it's it's still, uh, still right, so, a big problem. Yeah. So I read one somewhere that, that trucks and off-road equipment were about equal uh, contributors to the uh, to the particulate matter and the NOx. So it's not just trucks. That's the ones we see all the time, the backhoes and things that right. build our city, right? Uh, all the, that equipment, in addition to farm equipment, is using diesel, in addition to as Chris mentioned, uh, diesel generators that are used and uh, by a lot of businesses as some use it as backup generators. Some like um, you go to just weekend fairs. Well, we haven't in a while, but uh, a lot of people are using diesel equipment to run their, uh, their trucks, uh, the, the equipment inside their trucks uh, when they have food trucks or when they have um, other uh, playground, uh, you, you, you've seen uh, the little trains that take the kids around on the little tracks that some of these, are diesel? some of them are diesel and you can smell it and see it. And you wonder why are they putting kids in these, in these little trains behind a diesel engine? So um, what, about, what about the drivers or the operators of this equipment? Are they especially vulnerable or um, um, to these? Absolutely. Technologies? They're definitely uh, exposed to it. Um, and most of them, many of them are living in the neighborhood's uh, adjacent to freeways or major transportation corridors or uh, the port area. And so a lot of the truck drivers at the ports not only live among um, the most polluted areas, 
but they're driving and causing a lot more pollution. So they're exposed to it as well. All right. So we, we've heard about electric trucks and we heard about near zero emission trucks. Is that tech, are the technologies that are being developed for trucks able to be used on, for example, on equipment like construction equipment? Or, what's, or do we have to do a separate effort on that? Or is that a mad question? That's a mad question, not a mark uh, question. Uh, <laughs> and you want to answer that one right now? I'd be happy to. Well, it's also a Kevin Walkowitz question from CalStart, and okay. they're doing a lot of work on that. But um, there are clearly uh, efforts to commercialize cleaner technologies in the heavy duty sector, uh, many of which are on different paths towards commercialization. And I would just agree with Chris that there's a certain technology that's currently available now, uh, near zero natural gas engines, and there are others that are on the way, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's an issue of timing. All right, so if we find solutions to diesel trucks, is that effort applicable to these other sources? Is kind of what I'm, I mean, are we, yes. is it a twofer? If we do trucks, we, get, we, we do the other technologies? Yeah, clearly uh, the technologies can be transferred. Uh, it's a matter of scaling and, you know, residence time and all kinds of after treatment issues, but yes, it's possible. Kevin, do you agree with that? Sorry, Kevin Walkowitz. Do you agree that the um, that cleaning up trucks is also helps us a lot in cleaning up other diesel equipment like off road equipment, like backhoes and what have you, yeah. Kevin? A absolutely. I I think there's a lot of uh, like Matt said. There's there's some technology now on the near zero that that crosses over, but as, as in addition, we've got some of the zero emission technology. And some of the key component, <clears throat> key components, especially around battery energy storage, uh, that's that we're looking and we're seeing some crossover from getting developed in the heavy duty truck market that are now going into the off road uh, equipment uh, areas okay. as well. So we'll get into this a little bit more when we come to your part of the program. But I guess my point to you, Mark, is that um, it seems as if the solutions that we're developing for trucks can help us throughout the diesel sector um, in fairly short order. Am I right about is that? Yeah, is that in a fairly short order indeed. I mean, there are existing technologies and we know that and we know, um, I, you know, I don't think people realize how far uh, or how long we've known uh, about the uh, harms of diesel um, and, you know, not only have, you know, diesel was declared a carcinogen um, by the EPA and by CARB and um, at least, uh, and, and the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, many years ago, it, you know, um, OEHA in the state uh, said that, you know, there were impact, uh, it was harmful to public health uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so we've known about the harms and it's just, uh, Finally, we have solutions that can replace the diesel because, unfortunately, the uh, society has said it's more important to have diesel trucks for the movement of goods than it is to address the pollution from diesel. But now, that argument doesn't hold because we have alternatives. So if we can replace diesel trucks with other uh, engines, uh, cleaner engines, then we don't have the public health problem. And right, until so we, heard, we do that, we're going to have the public health problem. So we've heard reference to near zero natural gas and zero emission battery powered. Are there other options? Hydrogen is another option as well. Hydrogen trucks, like what, fuel cells? Yeah. All right, so um, now what, there's a fair amount of commercially available near zero natural gas. Batteries, battery-powered trucks are starting to arrive. Am, am I right about that? Uh, I was, yeah, I was at an event yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, with um, I guess it was yesterday, with uh, a number of prominent people, including the mayor of Long Beach, the mayor of, of LA, and the chairman of the uh, Air Resources Board, um, announcing a commitment from. Uh, one company, Electrify America, to invest in not only infrastructure, but in trucks. Um, 
you know, it's it's welcome, although it's not nearly enough as, 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 that's needed. But they had two trucks there that they said our uh, companies are not taking orders on these trucks. Um, that's fantastic, um, both electric. Um, and if they're going to be, uh, they say that as soon as they get a, num a certain number of orders, they'll start producing these trucks. So uh, they're telling us it could be in 2022. Uh, we're hopeful, we don't know. But in the meantime, um, there's also work from a number of companies on hydrogen. And right now with the ultra low NOx natural gas trucks, which already exist, we have an alternative to diesel already. So all three of these technologies are, are coming, uh, or two of these technologies are coming very soon, but one of them is already here. And so we can do something about it. And how much cleaner are they than diesel? Um, ultra low NOx is uh, like 90% cleaner than Matt, isn't that correct? Kevin? And 90%, good, good memory, Mark. Bring them well when he was at the Air District. <laughs> All right, so, so natural gas is 90, the, the near zero is 90% cleaner than the current oh. diesel. But, hey, let, let, me, let me just make a clarification. It's 90% cleaner on NOx and 100% cleaner on diesel particulate, right? There is no yeah. carcin carcinogenic diesel particulate from the natural gas engines. All right, so when I hear people say that natural gas uh, fuel is carcinogenic or toxic, and you're saying that's not right? I mean, there is a climate problem. There is a climate problem. Clearly there's a climate problem. There could be concerns over formaldehyde and other aldehydes, but those things can be controlled uh, more easily than the diesel particulate. Okay, well, we'll come back to that more in a minute. Um, so uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I just gonna... want to add one thing which is, you mentioned the climate impacts of natural gas. Um, there's obviously a lot of things you have to look at when you're talking about climate impacts and not just CO2. And as you've mentioned before, uh, the black carbon from diesel is also a significant problem with the climate. Yeah, and so is the ozone that's created by the NOx that comes from all of these, you know, or from diesel primarily, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. this whole thing we call short-lived climate pollutants. We'll get to that in a minute, but but um, for the moment, at least the current state of affairs, we've got uh, zero near zero emission natural gas and emerging, hopefully quickly, zero emission battery and, and hydrogen technologies. So it could be a whole new day for the next generation of, of breathers. Am I, is that fair? And there's really grounds for hope here now that we've got this technology developing? If you're talking to me, the answer is yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and I'll, also, I just want to mention what Breeze Southern California is doing is we have a campaign called End Diesel Now. Um, because the technology does exist and the harms are so great with the existing diesel, we, we are pushing very hard to get diesel uh, you know, removed sooner than just the 2045 date. Uh, that CARB has set for the end of sales of diesel vehicles and uh, diesel heavy duty vehicles. And we're, um, we're concerned that waiting 25 years, 24 years is another generation. And so the kids who are breathing in the diesel today, the kids who are having the asthma attacks um, and this generation is gonna uh, be old enough to have their own kids when uh, ultimately that uh, ban on new sales goes into effect. And so uh, we believe it has to happen sooner. And not and not wait. All right. So you support the Air Resources Board's advanced clean truck rule that they adopted a year ago or so. We support it, but we also would like to see a lot more movement, a lot more investment, and um, pushing diesel um, to get replaced uh, ASAP instead of ha setting a twenty-five year goal. Okay. So we're going to move now to Marvin Norman. Marvin, where are you? I see you. I'm right here. I'm going to bring you up on the screen, I hope. So, Marvin, you uh, you live out in the Inland Empire, am I correct? Right. Yep. Out here in San Bernardino. San Bernardino. Right. So I, you know, I I grew up out there in San Bernardino, right? Yeah, I used to live in Colton 
to actually so <laughs> yeah Col colton california is my hometown and um i, I remember that the first uh, uh mcdonald's uh started on e street in san bernardino it was called the bm in those days and we used to as high schoolers we would cruise the big m and that would be the you know the, the fun night out uh for those of us in colton and san bernardino does that still happen <laughs> um there's not much cruising on e street anymore um a lot of people i i think uh miss it but <clears throat> hasn't been much cruising in in a while but the mcdonald's is still there and it's now a museum if anyone wants to come out and visit it they... oh my god a museum mcdonald's is a museum <laughs> yeah it's a museum so you guys come on out and and visit it they sure love the attention <laughs> yeah my brothers still live out in uh in colton and one in one in barstow so uh the inland empire is still home for me, uh, so uh, you work with an organization. Um, uh, it's always called by most of us CCAEJ. What does CCAEJ stand for? Uh, we're the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, um, and we're based in Rupa Valley. Um, if you guys are familiar with um, the Stringfellow Pits, that's our roots and our yes. history. Yes, yes, I'm definitely. Definitely uh, recall that controversy and that challenge. So, um, um, what distinguishes your organization's view and efforts? I mean, you're, you fight for environmental, you know, for air quality, and for in the diesel as well. You have a, a something of a different emphasis. Uh, can you explain that to people listening? Right, so we focus on uh, community first and making sure the community concerns are brought to the forefront, uh, whether it be our monolingual non-English speaking communities, the uh, concerns they might have that aren't necessarily captured in in all the data sometimes, or whether it's, um, you know, kids who are in, in the corners. And we, we try to make sure to lift up the community voices and not just be a bunch of experts in a room telling what we think the community has with sometimes our real problems they're facing but we want the community to mention it not and we just seek to empower them so what is the expression environmental justice um intended to uh, convey uh <clears throat> yeah environmental justice we are focused on um you know the environmental racism and is that has impacted so many of the communities um from redlining of the years past to if you, you you know if you look at many of the redlining maps it uh, maps it pretty well with uh, now some of the you know the same communities where we are seeing these problems like were mentioned earlier in long beach and stuff and so we are focused on ending that and making sure that these communities have what they deserve what the resources that they missed in in previous years and that these wrongs or injustices are righted and most of all of course that the pollution is the polluting sources that have often been dumped in these communities are no longer the same threats. All right, so if, as I understand it, um, diesel air pollution is a major concern for CCAEJ as well. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's correct. So would you describe, can you tell us more about your work in that area and what you try to do and try to accomplish? Yeah, so if you, um, uh, diesel actually is, uh, as it's been mentioned by others already, it's one of the, it's probably the biggest uh, source of single source of air pollution and stuff in the Inland Empire. Um, actually, I did have a few slides. Um, and so if we... Are you able to put them up? Or you want me to... Uh... Uh, I can share screen. Um... Chris, can you make sure that... Uh... Okay, there he is. Right. So if we see here, this is um, from the AQMD's MATES 4. Um, I forgot what MATES stands for, actually, but um, this is the diesel, um, you know, the cancer risk. And as we can kind of see, it, it pretty much tracks the, loosely tracks the freeways through the region and the, ra the rail lines, which were, you know, predated the freeways in many cases. The freeways kind of just follow them. So we, we see this and we look at this um, map from MATES 4 and then we look at the newest Cal Enviro screen. And um, it, it kind of pretty much, you know, maps pretty well, pretty closely between the, the most disadvantaged communities um, here in, in, you know, in Moval around the warehouses area, San Bernardino, South Fontana, Colton, 
which we mentioned, uh, Ontario. And, and this maps pretty well with where we saw the, the increased risk um, out there from the, the freeway. So we have all these places that are coming in and all the diesel trucks that are going on the freeways to service the warehouses that keep going up. And it's not just the freeways, I would add, um, because, you know, the warehouses are, are, are served by these arterials. So especially along the arterials too, you see the same sort of concerns. And, and so now what we're getting to is the warehouse continues to just be pushed everywhere. And so um, this is a, a community in Highland it is right here, the residential community. And then but a big issue we're seeing too is that what one city will approve projects that are right on their border edge that impact another city's communities, but with, um, you know, that other city can't control the land use decisions of the first city. So they are being stuck with these monstrosities literally right in their backyards and it, I took this picture and behind the frame is a school elementary school so these kids are going to be uh, you know subjected to this pollution from these from the trucks serving this place for decades and so um, some of the work we've been in of course is the ISR um, with uh, there at the AQMD we've been a, a big contributor of getting that work passed and so we are hopeful that it will be a, a very good way to help reduce the use of diesel in the region. Um, explain, explain to our audience what an ISR is. Um, I, I think Matt could probably actually explain it better than I can. But like what indirect source rule but, or something like that. But yeah, it's the indirect source rule um, because you, um, it, it's focusing on the fact that you know AQMD doesn't have the authority to regulate trucks themselves, but they can regulate where the trucks go to, and, and so. The, that's the the general layman's term. So the idea is a rule that um, helps to uh, prevent accumulation of trucking at different sites like at warehouses um, and creating an extra burden for people who live near those warehouses, right? Right. And so it offers a menu of options um, it, it, that the the warehouse operators can use to to meet the compliance and reduce their emissions or they there's also a fee option if they feel that's the best way they can do it um we we have we we of course would prefer they just reduce their emissions but you know the fee option is there for them as well all right so um you know that that, that isn't an, a strategy to get them to stop having warehouses it's a strategy to get them to change from what from diesel trucks to something else. So what is what is the goal here? Um, yeah, I mean you you've brought up an interesting issue, and in that at CCAJ, uh, the the air pollution part of it really is only one uh, of the concerns we've had with warehousing. And so, um, in many in a number of cases, we would really prefer they not build the warehouse at all. There are several like for example the picture i showed we we don't want a warehouse right next to houses you know even beyond the air quality issues there are other noise quality issues etc and you know safety issues from the trucks so um but the very least with the air quality we, we're thankful that that will be addressed and and so um what does success look like in in addressing this uh, environmental justice burden the Inland Empire. What, is it, what, what, what would what, what does success look like? Uh, success for in, uh, addressing the EJ issues here in the Inland Empire would be um, a just uh, transition from the you know out of the diesel trucks and stuff. Um, the another part of our work is the reality that a, a lot of people in our communities do in fact work as truck drivers and have to use end up using these diesel trucks. So we have. As we are working, we want to make sure that, you know, any drivers that are misclassified, they have the support they need to get the correct classification so they are not try being forced to, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of money they don't have to try to get a truck or be shut out of, the, shut out of their job. Um, but at the same time, we, we definitely want the pollution cleaned up and, you know, especially the diesel pollution and the rail yards too um, are another issue, even though... Um, we don't necessarily have the same level of uh, ability to regulate them, unfortunately, but they are, uh, again, a massive issue as well. 
All right, so, um, this, so Mark um, and Chris referenced um, zero emission trucks. Apparently there are products starting to be available that are battery powered, um, that are hydrogen powered. And they also talked about um, near zero emission natural gas trucks that are, that are engine powered, but not diesel. Um, to, does CCE AEJ have a view regarding these technologies? Yeah, we prefer um, the zero um, because uh, again, we're also concerned about climate, overall climate change. So um, uh, the, the close, the as zero as possible is, is what we prefer. Um, we obviously, we understand that sometimes, you know, the, the near zero as well, but we, we've been pushing for zero, especially as more options have come online. And especially since, um, I know a lot of times people say, hey, you know, what about the, the truckers who are driving from here to Iowa and Pennsylvania? But if you look at um, SCAG data, like 80% of truck traffic in, in the SCAG region is within SCAG region. So it's entirely possible for most of it to already be electrified or, or with battery or hydrogen already. So we, we'd prefer that they move to skip the near zero as, as much as possible and go straight to zero. All right. So, yeah, I've heard uh, something similar that, that um, if you're you know, battery power, we all know this from when the battery electric cars were coming out, that the issue was always the range and how long it took to charge. But if it's all within what we call the basin, Southern California, Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, LA County, that's a kind of constrained marketplace, right? And where, where, where a vehicle probably starts from a barn one morning and ends up back at the barn in the evening, right? So that looks like a scenario that could be battery electric could really work. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, you know, we have several, you know, uh, uh, outspringing of distribution centers. I recently heard um, that they're expecting that we need the whole country at a whole needs about 350 million square feet of distribution space by 2025. And knowing the trends, I would expect they plan to put a hundred million of it in the Inland Empire. So, oh my God. <laughs> it's like 100 million square foot warehouses. 100, yes. And I, I currently know about six or eight that are currently under construction and like another same amount under, you know, the World Logistics Center is 40 million square feet worth of warehouse. So it, it's certainly planned. So we. we right. So if, if all of the trucks that operate that don't leave the basin, right, not long haul trucks, those look like they could be uh, zero emission probably, right? That's what. I <clears throat> I hope so. That I, they'd look like it to me. Now, now the other group in the long haul trucks go that have to travel to. I have a, I have a nephew who lives in the Inland Empire, who uh, is a trucker, and occasionally he sends me, you know, screenshots of him at some different part of the of the country, and uh, when he goes out on a on a job with a truck, um, but it's not usually his truck. And he's never quite clear where he's going to go. He's going to go out, make a drop off, and get a new, get up a new load, and drive around. He's kind of navigates back, back home after, golly, two weeks, three weeks. Um, never quite clear where he's going. So, how how about um, zero emission uh, technology there, battery or hydrogen? Um, seemed like, what do you think about that? I, I think it's all great. And I would add to that. I mean, California, you know, as we've discussed earlier, you know, ports of P the San Pedro Bay ports are the biggest port complex in the country. About uh, about 40% of all the traffic comes in. And California really is has a lot of influence. I know on my trips across the country, even now, you know, I see a lot of trucks in like Alabama or Tennessee or like Texas or something. And they all have the clean air, the California clean air stickers on them already. So you know, truckers, any truck company that wants to do business in California, which is probably going to be many, will buy a compliant truck is what it boils down to, I think. All right. So if you were to have a, be able to, you know, uh, have your way with the environment, with the regulatory 
agencies like the South Coast Air District or or the California Air Resources Board or like um, what would you tell them? I mean, they, they adopted an advanced clean truck rule, right, about a year ago or something that is supposed to force manufacturers to create an ever increasing share of zero emission battery or hydrogen powered, uh, right? Um, I think that they're looking at a fleet rule also, which is to affect the market side, not just the manufacturer side. What more should we be doing? And you've got your your independent your uh, direct source rule. So what more needs to be done, can be done to make this cleanup happen? Honestly, I think um, you know we could rat ratchet up the dates. Really, <laughs> the, we won the clean air yesterday, right? So yeah. <laughs> so accelerate as as the possible. effort. Yeah, and uh, and also find some way to to touch the railroads. <laughs> well, if we had a Mary Nichols used the expression boatload of money. Um, uh, to help here, to provide incentives to accelerate. Do you think that'd help? And if we had that, what would your priorities be? Um, yeah, it, it definitely would help. And the priorities would be to provide support for the independent truckers um, who are going to be shut out as, as fleets are able to electrify because they can afford it. The independent truckers, we definitely need to get help for them. And also, I mean, Metrolink studied um, electrifying the rails. Skag has studied electrifying the rails. Skag has studied electrifying the rails again. Cost about ten billion dollars. Put money. Let's let's do it. And with, all right. So investing in infrastructure like charging infrastructure and and incentives for people to accelerate their purchasing of zero emission uh, vehicles. Right. We we definitely need that intersectional. With, um lens because we do need to reduce diesel but um we can't leave people behind as it happens all right so if there was a uh an opportunity to create a fund maybe there's a ballot measure maybe it's a, a proposal before the air resources or before the legislature assuming that was structured right that's something that could be um, a real contributor to success here yeah definitely we could uh certainly see uh ways for it to be helpful. Okay, well, um, we will look forward to your feedback as we go forward on discussing all these options. And if you have anything that you hear from any of the other speakers here that you think needs to be um, corrected or adjusted from an environmental justice point of view, please feel free to, I think if you speak up, you, you command the TV screen. <laughs> it's the way the Zoom works. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep muted unless um, I need to do that. Okay, so I'm going to show a few slides myself right now because there's a part of this that really I think needs to um, be highlighted as well. Okay, let's see, screen there. All right, so what we've heard so far is that diesel vehicles are enormous sources of air pollution and, and bad health for people who live in Southern California. But what a lot of people don't know is that diesel is also a big time global warming forcer. Uh, partly that's because uh, transportation overall is one of the primary sources of carbon dioxide um, and uh, diesel, I think, is about a third of that, if I'm mistaken. Matt, Matt might correct me. Uh, when he, is that right, Matt? About a third of the, of the uh, transportation-based uh, CO2? I'm not familiar with the uh, percent for CO2. I can just tell you about criteria pollutants. Okay. All right. So, but, but the other thing that people often don't know about diesel is that it's a major source of what are called super pollutants. And I found just, I think I found just the right font for super pollutant. <laughs> and one of those super, and super pollutants, by the way, are also called short lived climate pollutants. Um, and they have an outsized effect on the climate because they're frankly more powerful than CO2. 
black carbon here, I think, is about 3,000 times more powerful than CO2 in terms of its climate forcing ability. The good news is it does not last very long, a matter of weeks, whereas CO2 lasts a couple hundred years. So black carbon is a short-lived climate pollutant, but very powerful. That's also known as particulate matter uh, from diesels. And then down the other one here, another super pollutant is tropospheric ozone. Now that's ozone as we normally think of it. And that's the primary thing the air district regulates. But it regulates it by regulating NOx because NOx causes ozone. All right, so diesel in addition to ozone for health purposes and particulate matter for health purposes and air toxins also does a lot of climate damage. And if we were going to succeed um, at getting our uh, climate under control, we've got to deal with diesel. Um, some people say these short-lived climate pollutants contribute about 45% of the global warming. Almost half of the global warming comes from these short-lived climate pollutants. And if we were to eliminate, have a disciplined effort at getting rid of short-lived climate pollutants, um, then we could cut the global warming by 0.6 degrees Celsius, which is important because the standard we're trying to avoid is 1.5 degrees. So cutting 0.6 is like almost not quite half um, a reduction in our, in, our, in our warming since industrial revolution started. Now, you mentioned black carbon and um, ozone, but two others, HFCs, um, and then methane. Now, methane may be the single most important short-lived climate pollutant that we have to deal with. And happily, diesel does not, is not a source of methane. But it is a source of black carbon and ozone. There was a United Nations panel that told us that if we wanted to avoid calamity with our climate, we must have dramatic reductions by 2030. So we at Move LA treat this decade as the decade of decision for this. 2030 is not the only deadline. There's a deadline that the air district faces for other reasons. The federal air standard requires them to meet um, the NOx standard. I think 2028 is actually an earlier target, right? Then 2031. And if, and if the air district does not meet that, there's a risk of federal sanctions. Now, most of the time the federal government has not sanctioned their districts. Sometimes there are people in the White House or in Congress you worry really might sanction them. And the sanction is holding back transportation funding. So we have two decades or one decade have two big deadlines, all of which has to um, uh, can't happen without transforming diesel sector. So, California Air Resources Board adopted the uh, advanced clean truck rule. And if you see this, um, can I move that over so that the right column shows up? Um, this is a, a strategy where each of the manufacturers has to have an increasing number of zero emission trucks in these different classes, uh, starting in 2024 and ending in 2035. The class seven and eight, I guess my, um, I didn't realize that the Zoom thing would show on that. Can we move this? Oh, there it is, okay. Now these are the long haul trucks, class seven and eight, and an increasing percentage of zero. Now, you'll notice that we never, we don't get to 100% anytime, except maybe in that class four to eight, we get close. If we add all this up, And see if I, ooh, did I lose it? Uh, if you add all this up, we get about one third of all trucks at 2035 will be the new trucks sold during that decade. Not 10 of the used trucks will be zero emission. Of the long haul, about one fourth will be zero emission. 
Now, another way to put that is that three fourths won't be zero emission. So even if the advanced clean truck rule happens, large majority of trucks will still be diesel unless there's something else we do. So that's part of the lesson. This is a strong rule. Now, the advanced clean fleet rule and more incentives can accelerate that. But the question is, how much can we get in squeezing diesel technologies? And so we're going to go. But there are other there are other issues besides diesel trucks. And there's a um, there's shipping at the ports it is also a concern. And we have with us Madeline Rose. Uh, from Pacific Environment. I'm going to stop sharing here so we can get Madeline up. Hi, Madeline. Hey, Denny. Hey, everyone. So listen, you've been hearing us talk about diesel, and you're talking about shipping. Now, shipping doesn't use diesel fuel, does it? So some ships, so the sort of majority of the merchant marine fleet, so the big container ships around the world, are still running on heavy fuel oil. Um, but a lot of the smaller vessels, um, there is sort of a, a marine diesel oil that some do run on or they can run on. It's compatible in both engines. Um, and then a lot of the smaller ships that you see in, in the harbor, like work boats, tugboats, um, uh, ferries, they, some of those do run on diesel. So, and either way, they're all running on fossil, they're still running on fossil fuels, whether it's diesel or you know, heavy fuel oil, they're both fossil based. And so some people use the expression bunker fuel to refer to that heavy fuel oil. It's just like lower down on the uh, on the distillation chart, I guess, for uh, oil products, right? Yeah, as, as Mark um, Perala is saying, he's correct. It's, it's basically the, the, the sludge of the, uh, for the oil after the refining process. So um, sort of oil companies figured out, you know, 100 years ago or so that they could use, they could sort of use the, the excess of the refining process of crude that they would have already that they would have otherwise thrown away and not made a profit on, they figured out that those could run uh, in, in um, major ship engines. And sort of that's how the heavy fuel oil market really um, survived. Right, so that's a source of emissions also, right? Mostly yeah. out, but what, all right, so would people be concerned about it? I mean, because ships that cross the Atlantic, for example, or the Pacific are out on the ocean um, most of the time, much of the time. So why yeah. should this be a concern? Yeah, so my, my job today and, and um, kind of every day these days, it feels like, is to sort of um, say, you know, we have to decarbonize and get ships off fossil fuels too. So there's so much energy right now around the zero emission transportation tra transformation around cars and trucks, like, like we've been talking about um, today. Um, and we're sort of here to say, you know, let's take that energy to ships too. So in California, um, and in the United States, marine vessels or ships are regulated as an off-road mobile source. So I know that, that term has come up a couple of times today. So when we say off-road, that means ships too. And technically, you know, off-road sources, just like on-road, just like your cars and trucks, those, are, um, those need to be included in all of our policies for zero emission transportation. Um, so shipping is, yeah, an incredible, incredible problem, um, not just to, you know, the oceans and ocean health, but also to the people of Los Angeles and Long Beach and Californians in particular. So globally, um, the shipping industry is one of the world's worst polluters um, from, from air, of air and climate. So the international shipping industry accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of the world's total sulfur and NOx emissions. It accounts for about 10 percent of global PM 2.5 emissions. Uh, which is the pollutant that um, Marissa spoke about per in her personal story at the top of the panel. Um, and then on the climate side, international shipping accounts for about 3% of the world's total climate emissions. That's akin to the entire national emissions of Germany or Japan. So if shipping were a country, it would be the world's sixth largest climate polluter. Um, and again, as many of the colleagues on the panel have said today, um, you know, this is a huge problem for LA and, and Long Beach because the ports of LA and Long Beach manage about 40% of America's maritime imports. So we are, you know, there's a huge concentration of fossil fuel pollution from ships in the South Coast Air Basin. And in fact, um, South Coast colleagues 
have said about, they came out last year or a year ago about projecting that by 2023, um, ships will account for the majority of NOx emissions in the South Coast Air Basin, surpassing heavy duty trucks. Sorry, 2023? Um, yep, so right around the corner. Whoa. <laughs> yep. And in some ways, that's because of the great leadership of so many of you on this call today to really push for cleaner cars and cleaner trucks and other clean, clean on-road sources. Um, so, but you know, the, the point is we, we really need to bring all of this energy around the zero emission transportation transition to marine vessels too. Um, so yeah, happy to talk about, about okay, sort of so, solution set and what we're pushing for, but if you have any questions first. Yeah, as, so are there good alternatives to the bunker fuel and diesel uh, technologies used by shipping now? I mean, we've heard about near zero and zero battery hydrogen. Are any of those applicable to the shipping? Yep. So it's a pretty similar solution set as trucks. Um, so first and foremost, we say electrify everything. Like let's electrify everything we possibly can. So a lot of the smaller boats, ferries, work boats, pilot boats, tugboats, all the smaller ships that we see in, a, in the harbor or at port that support kind of the bigger you know, cargo ship operations, the vast majority of those we think can be electrified. Um, and in fact, we think the vast majority can be electrified between now and 2035. Um, so we're, we're really pushing um, the state of California and happy to talk about that more, um, but to require 100% zero emission harbor craft by 2035. When it comes to the bigger ships, um, the solution set that we endorse is a transition to 100% um, green hydrogen-based fuels. So just this morning, in fact, um, Maersk, the world's largest shipping company, um, announced some updates um, for its first carbon neutral cargo ship, um, which is currently in production. They're trying to get it on the water by 2023. It's going to be built uh, by a South Korean shipyard, which is exciting for um, you know the kind of our our um, Trans-Pacific corridor here in California. It means that you know South Korea is going to start to be building these these ships, um, and uh, it will be. So, so it's not an ideal solution in our opinion, but it's a step. So it's, it, it still is gonna be running on a internal combustion engine and it will be powered by 100% green methanol or 100% green ammonia, which is when a hydrogen based fuel. 100% green, green, what does that mean? So I'm, I'm not a fuels expert, but what that means um, as I understand it is that the methanol can be produced through an electrolysis process. Um, so that's like when we did in science, we had the electricity through water creating mm -hmm. hydrogen. Yep. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So I'm glad you said that about it. I, I was, I was trying to imagine how a long haul shipper might charge, um, the batteries if it was trying to go across the ocean with just battery power. Makes complete sense around the harbor because you can, you know, you can plug in places in the harbor. But when you're out on the ocean, not so easy. So for that, you say hydrogen is the best option. Yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll just just respond. I see in the chat from Mark and Paul that you know excessive consumption is a huge problem, and I just say we completely agree. Um, and you know, part of the, the 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 international the global shipping fleet has quadrupled in size since the 1980s because we are, you know, an American consumption and American economic policies is really driving a lot of that. So happy to talk about that more about some of our ideas, but um, we, we do agree with that. Um, nevertheless, in terms of, you know, as we look at the decade of climate emergency and the just, you know, millions of folks who are dying from fossil fuel air pollution every year, we are trying to straddle, you know, we, we straddle advocating for immediate reduction solutions on the technology side and these longer and these bigger term policies around consumption. Um, so, so Denny, your question is about what do we see on the hydrogen side? So um, there's a great report that was put out by the International Council on Clean Transportation uh, about a year ago, I think in November, that showed the feasibility of, um, repl use, of replacing fuel oil on the Trans-Pacific trade route. So from um, China to, um, you know, from major Chinese ports to LA Long Beach, replacing that with hydrogen um, vessels. It's, it's a theoretical scenario right now, but they mapped out 
what the, and they basically show that this would be possible with minor changes to existing engines and or you know new ships that are actually run on hydrogen fuel cells eventually. Um, and that the only real change would be a couple more stops. So right now, because heavy fuel oil you know, is so powerful that honestly, these cargo ships could run around the whole planet. They could, you know, they can cruise the entire planet and sometimes not even have to stop for refueling. But that's ridiculous. And, and you know, except we don't need that in <laughs> a decade of climate emergency, right? That's sort of um, irresponsible um, capitalism. So in a hydrogen scenario, they may have to stop a few more times, like Hokkaido, Japan, or the you know, outside of Dutch Harbor in Alaska, we, they, ICCT actually mapped out different, you know, addition, new zero emission bunkering refueling stations that you could add along the corridor. Um, so you don't mean to, so you're not suggesting floating stations, for example? Well, I mean, Singap so Singapore is the world's largest bunkering hub on, in the world. They, they, about, they own about 40% of all of the refueling that happens in the maritime industry today happens in Singapore and their fossil fuel you know, gas stations, basically. Um, and so are they floating? I mean, kind of. So they're man-made islands that Singapore invested in. Right. But they don't have to be, right? They, they could be, yeah, whether they're going to be like on land in Long Beach or floating, I, um, you know, not my job to figure out, but uh, I think it'll be a, a you know. All right, so there's a, close, there, there's a close parallel between transforming the trucking industry and transforming the shipping industry, both in terms of kind of fuels they now use and the environmental burdens they create, as well as the solutions that are before us. Um, we see long haul trucking is kind of parallel to shipping. Um, and we see the hydrogen options as well as the battery options there, although they don't have to float um, their, you know, their charging facilities. That might be easier. Uh, but um, what, do, what do we think we need to do on the shipping side? What are the procedures? What, what are you trying to accomplish that will do this for us? Laws, yeah. change, incentives, creative. What is it that will transform? Yep. So um, we have kind of four solution or four strategies we wanted to highlight today. So one is, you know, focus now on the smaller ships, right? We need, we need to demonstrate the feasibility of technologies and reduce emissions where we can. So like I said, harbor craft, all the commercially regulated harbor craft, they're, you know, those, the, just the harbor craft segment is the fourth largest um, driver of carcinogens in the South Coast Basin, right? So these are tugboats, um, work boats, pilot boats, ferries. We can electrify those or shift those to hydrogen fuel cell ships now, this decade, in the, you know, the next 10, 15 years. So we're really pushing. Um, we are a part of a, a coalition of, of environmental justice groups, community groups, and environmental groups um, currently working together to push the California Air Resources Board and the ports for 100% zero emission harbor craft um, by 2035, and we would love all the help we can get from folks on the panel. Please be in touch, um, and we can link you up with that campaign. And then after sort of the small ships, you know, then then we got then we look to the big ships, and there we are really advocating for a similar suite of policies as has been done on on road trucks, right? So basically, we need California and other you know major port states, whether it's the United States or Canada, the EU, South Korea. Mm -hmm. to to put in place technology forcing regulations that force the development of these alternative solutions. Um, and there's a number of ways you can go about that, right? Similar to the truck rule, you could sort of mandate phase-ins like zero emission phase-ins. You can mandate carbon intensity reductions. There's kind of a, a couple of things in the policy toolkit that we're advocating for, but the top line being we have to start now, you know, we have to put this industry on a transition off fossil fuels and they're not gonna do it on their own. So there has to be mandatory regs. Um, the third approach um, is sort of a more of a regional approach. So th there's a, a lot of energy um, right now around clean shipping corridors. So looking at you know, where there are regular routes where we can just commit to you know, those as first movers. So for example, Long Beach to Honolulu. It's a regular shipping route. It's the same ships that just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's not this like complicated trade route. Um, so, you know, let's focus in on that. Let's decarbonize that route. Let's phase in 100% zero emission, you know, ships on those routes. Or there's like short sea options, right? From San Diego to 
LA Long Beach to Seattle Tacoma? Could we could we you know commit to decarbonizing or achieving 100% zero emission ships on the U.S. West Coast and demonstrate that first? Yeah, it's like having charging or uh, hydrogen fueling corridors for trucks. Yep, exactly. Very 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 comparable uh, kinds of challenges. Exactly. So. One of our one of our listeners in the chat room um, asked a question about whether um, these, this hydrogen could be fuel cells rather than combustion. You are talking fuel cells, right? Or are you talking combustion as well? So, um, hydrogen. Our uh, yeah, I'll say our ideal solution at this moment, as you know, advocates is is that we we do think that a hundred percent clean hydrogen fuel cells is going to be the cleanest solution that will, you know, have no, G there'll be no climate pollution and there'll be no air pollution, right? However, right now, um, you know, no major sh shipper has uh, joined us in that, um, in that, that commitment. So the, the kind of closest thing is green ammonia or green methanol run through an internal combustion engine. Um, and so that's where we are right now. It is a step. Um, we we hope that by you know by the end of this decade, every new ship, you know, on the global order book is uh, a clean hydrogen fuel cell ship, possibly. But again, I, I you know um, that's what we think is the best right, based on the technology, based on the research that's available today. Um, and you know we just want to push them to 100% zero emission. And we're concerned that quite frankly that you know so long as a fuel is being combusted in a combustion engine, there's always going to be you know, NOx emissions, right? So then you have the after treatment solutions, but, you know, our position is why would, why not push as, as, you know, other, other colleagues on the panel have said, you know, um, um, you know, Marvin in particular, right? Like we would prefer that they just go 100% zero emissions. So that's what we're pushing for. All right. So maybe we can get some insight about what's possible from um, our folks from CalStart and, and from um, <clears throat> the Air District's technology office. Excuse me for frogging my throat, but Kevin. Yeah, hey, hey, got thanks. some questions for you, sir. Kevin, tell us our our watchers who CalStart is and what you're trying to do. Sure, uh, CalStart's been around, and and uh, maybe I don't know all the. I've only been with CalStart for about a year, but CalStart's been around for about 30 years now. Um, we're the kind of the nation's one of the nation's leading <clears throat> clean transportation advocacy groups. Uh, we're a member-based organization. We have over 300 industry uh, and other um, organizations as members. Um, we are providing support, information, um, and pushing for a lot of these things that uh, that you're talking about on this panel. So, um, if you if you don't mind, I had a few slides. I well, let's watch. Cool. What's that? Yeah, bring it on. Yeah. Okay. And I I, I think. Uh, the last conversation with the marine uh, vessels is pretty interesting. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of parallels in how we're approaching trucking uh, versus what I just heard on the marine side of things. So a lot of around you know clean corridors, where and how are you going to fuel them? What uh, applications make the most sense, and and where kind of technology might be applicable to uh, the different uh, applications? So. So trucking, I, I've been uh, looking at this issue for quite a while. I spent a lot of time at the, the national labs in the Department of Energy looking at commercial vehicles. Um, one of the uh, kind of the guiding uh, thoughts that CalStart uh, has is the idea of these beachheads. So we're, um, and I assume you can see my screen. Is that correct, Danny? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So this is the CalStart beachhead. We the, the theory is that you know, different segments, different types of vehicles will be ready at different times. And that includes the technology, the infrastructure, uh, and, you know, most commercial vehicle uh, purchasing decisions are, are, are financially based. You know, these businesses are trying to make money. So looking at the total cost of ownership, which includes the upfront purchase, incremental cost, as well as any savings in uh, in fuel use or maintenance or service or things like that. So we, we think, you know, a lot of these, and this is a, a very fluid uh, chart that I'm showing. We, we kind of update it every year. This goes, uh, I think CARB uses this in their three-year heavy-duty investment strategy just to kind of frame out types of 
vehicles and types of applications that we think will be ready for market first. And if you kind of notice on the left side of the screen, you know, depot fuel vehicles return to base type vehicles um, or, or just vehicles that don't require a lot of uh, battery capacity maybe are the first uh, to be ready for market. The longer haul vehicles and those that are out uh, kind of on the open road, like you, like you mentioned with your nephew driving a truck, you never know where he's going to be. You know, those are the more difficult applications to really have ready for market. So this is kind of the thought process that we've gone through on a lot of these. Uh, but Cal Starts has spent a lot of time kind of understanding um, what, what the tech readiness is and how, where, where are the needs? What are the needs? You know, is it incentives? Is it, is it more R and D? Is it demonstrations? Deployments? Can we go back to that first slide? I just got a sure. question. Sure. Yeah. Right. So the red line there, that's about us now, right? Kind we're of where we're at right now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so when you look at the, uh, the heavy regional freight that you're talking, uh, category there, I mean, just to the left a year ago, it looks like the medium freight service is that um, while there's some demonstration, there's actual product under production now in that category. And then here for the heavy regional freight, then we're really talking about demonstration projects and maybe starting production soon, maybe this year. Do Correct. we have any sense of the numbers of uh, actual production that we're talking about? Uh, we're working on that now, you know, it's, they're ramping up slowly, right? And production uh, facilities are still being developed on a lot of these, uh, but early, early pilot models are getting built now and they're getting deployed uh, through programs like the uh, CARB CEC drainage truck uh, pilots that were just announced. So there's, yeah. you know, one of the it's questions. in the hundreds though. Yeah, not, um, and kind of uh, my, my first take is, you know, for the next few years, ramping up to the ACT requirements are going to kind of be the production volumes that these trucks. ACT, have. Advanced Clean Truck Rule. Yes. All right. So, so um, not on the heavy duty side, not a lot of demonstrations now, but not much production yet. And one of the, as you go through your slides, one of the key questions I think is how quickly can um, zero emission, particularly uh, battery and hydrogen, how quickly can they ramp up production? Because okay. if you remember back earlier in the program, we highlighted two decision for two decade targets. One decade was the 2031 uh, clean air attainment date for the air district. And the other one, which seems more ominous, is the IPCC report that says, if we don't have these dramatic emission reductions by 2030, we may not ever make it from, from getting, right? So we're trying to take that 2030 date seriously and trying to see how rapidly can these zero emission technologies be ramped up in their production? So think about that as you go through your slides. I've got a good slide on that, so I'm glad you asked that. So I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but, I guess the point of this slide is we're trying to understand what what the readiness is and where the investments are needed, whether it's in California or nationally. So uh, we're spending a lot of time right now leaning into what's needed at the federal level. Um, and I and I think you you mentioned the the idea of this is a global this is a global issue. Uh, the CalStar Drive to Zero program. We're trying to take the, the California ACT. Uh, we've already got the 15 state, maybe it's one or two more now that have signed on to that, but the 15 state MOU that basically says, we're gonna adopt the, the ACT um, rules, regs, uh, make an environment for that. We're trying to push for that at the national level as well. And then globally, uh, the Drive to Zero program is trying to get uh, as many countries and organizations to sign up for a global MOU, which would effectively push for those same types of levels of adoption uh, for, for clean trucks. So kind of that progression, but you, using uh, California as a, as a good example, and I, I kind of call it the trifecta of programs right now, right? You've got ACT, uh, which is the manufacturer sales requirements. You've got ACF that you mentioned, Denny the advanced clean fleet rule that's gonna require fleets to make purchases of these vehicles. 
Um, and then you've got HVIP, which is out there providing uh, incentives for these trucks that have a higher incremental cost than their conventional or diesel counterparts. All right, so, yeah. trifecta is rule on the manufacturer, rule on the fleet, incentives to them and everybody else. Yep, yep. Okay. And then and then the fourth part, I don't know if you'd call it the quad vector or something like that, but the infrastructure, <laughs> yeah. the infrastructure support that you mentioned earlier, and that's right. really getting handled by the, the CEC in California. But um, you know, there's a big incentive program out now for medium heavy duty infrastructure. It's going to be hitting the street, uh, I think, this year or next, and it's going to provide some pretty significant incentives. Uh, for that type of work and then a lot of utilities with their make ready programs that needs to happen to help with the installation costs on the utility side as well as trying to uh, help maybe change some of the rate structures out there um, some recent you know total cost of ownership models show you need to be down in that total cost of electricity for battery electric trucks 12 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you have demand charges uh, that are costing a lot or just trying to amortize the cost of installing the equipment, you, you don't make that. And it doesn't make the TCO work for a lot of these trucks out there. So you got to think about the infrastructure as well. So, but I, I think that's, that's happening in California. We're trying to push that at a national level. Good. Um, let me, um, I just have a couple more this is kind of what our, when we go through and say, hey, we're looking at what the readiness is of the technology, we try to segment it out by a lot of different applications out there, um, not only between fuel cell and battery electric, but then the different kinds of vehicles that have different types of use cases and duty cycles and require maybe different levels of, of battery or energy storage, different infrastructure approaches, but just trying to understand where a lot of these different technologies are. We are seeing a lot of significant growth in some of these areas. Some are moving faster than others. Um, just real quick, and, and this is also, uh, this is included in the CARB three-year heavy duty investment strategy. But if you see the, the yellow circle versus the blue diamond, um, it kind of sounds like a Lucky Charms commercial, but um, the, you can see the gap there. The blue diamond is uh, this year's where we think it is, and the yellow circle is where it was last year. So we're seeing more and more manufacturers offer products that are capable of, of doing doing the uh, the work that they needed to well, do. I don't, I don't see long haul trucking. You got one for long haul trucking? That, that's included in the heavy duty delivery. And a good example there last year when we did this, there was there was one commercially available truck out there. Now there's at least six that are offered for sale in this segment. So we're seeing that market acceleration happening. We're seeing some of these uh, models become available. Long long haul, yeah. There's uh, you know limited by battery capacity right now. We're kind of seeing pretty good product offerings out in the maybe 250 mile range for battery. Uh, and then absolutely. Uh, excited about all the fuel cell truck uh, activity that's going on as well for long haul. You know, you've got um, you've got uh, Toyota fuel cell now taking their Mirai fuel cells and putting those into different truck manufacturer chassis uh, for those applications. G uh, GM just announced a partnership with Navistar. Uh, you got some of the other key players, uh, Cummins and others, that are, are working on projects, fuel cell projects for for truck manufacturers. So. It's, it's getting there, it's gaining some momentum, but you know, there's still a few few years away. So if, if one wanted, if we needed to, for example, um, to get diesel off the road, are there alternatives for long haul trucking in the near term, either now or in the near term, really could, really are able to uh, produce significant numbers? Yeah, and I'm glad that's my next slide here. I, I'm going to reference NACFI, which is the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. It's a partner we work with quite often, but they've they've kind of turned the the, uh, the name messy middle for you know between now and when we get to zero emission, however long that might last. But you know this the next five to ten years, yeah, there are options for the long haul that aren't you know reliant on battery electric or fuel cell electric, but um, what what makes the most sense uh, financially for the fleets? But you know you've got the the low NOx options from natural gas, 
Um, there are still some range extended hybrids out there. Uh, you've, and frankly, some of the first gen battery electric trucks and fuel cell electric trucks. And so, and so these, are, these are all technologies that are much cleaner than diesel. Cleaner so than had, diesel so, for criteria emissions, yes. Yes. And so some if for. We were, if we were worried about whether we were making this 2030 date for the, uh, for the uh, climate change targets, um, we would have to be relying upon these during the interim? These and a small share of the zero emission options as well. All right, so the zero emission will be there, but it won't be all of it. Will the, will, how, how soon does zero emission dominate? Well, these, these are some of our projections that we've put together. I don't know if you can see them, but the ACT rule, the ramp up, what we think for class seven and eight uh, tractors, both long haul in the blue and then short haul in the green. But just looking at what where ACT is going to get. And then some of the factors we looked at to try to understand, can we meet it? Can we exceed it? Here's, here's where we think the markets might be. But the green curve for this is kind of the track we're on now, where we think short haul regional tractors can get to uh, by 2030. You know, you're, you're getting close to that 50% uh, addressable market, we call it like that. It's, it's, uh, it, it can work, it, it can be ready uh, for use in those markets. I think to get to accelerate that curve, um, a lot of things need to happen. And I, I have this and then one more slide and I'll, I'll kind of go through um, the, some of the factors that we're pushing on to try to get to that red curve, that higher penetration curve. But the number one bullet you see there is breakthroughs in battery technology. And uh, I know you wanted to talk about that a little bit, but we need, we need the cost reductions and we need the manufacturing uh, capacities uh, worked on now. We really need to push that harder than it's happening right now. Uh, we need strong OEM and, and fleet rules in California and nationally. It, you know, there's a big question about scalability and uh, cost with the truck manufacturers. That they're, they're not going to be able to provide low-cost trucks if they're selling in the hundreds. You know, you need to get the volumes up so that they can take advantage of the economy of scale. Uh, federal incentives, infrastructure investments, and then innovative. Uh, finance options too for some of these fleets that can't afford or that maybe normally don't buy uh, brand new trucks. They're in the secondary markets or maybe they just don't have access to capital to, to purchase uh, some of these uh, trucks that are out there now. So this is kind of, you know, the five areas on the left. These are the things we're working on. And again, notice the number one uh, to topic up there is battery technology, driving down cost via volume, and really, there, there's not nearly enough um, battery manufacturing capacity in the US right now to support uh, those growth curves that I just showed. So battery technology, battery manufacturing is a key part of enabling the zero emission uh, battery electric trucks uh, for the future. But then- so if, we wanted, if, if, if we really wanted to facilitate, accelerate that, um, a boatload of money could help. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And we're we're pushing for that at the federal level. CalStart and a few other organizations, but maybe a, a U.S. battery manufacturing initiative to really reduce cost and increase capacity at, in the U.S. All right, it so couldn't for, hurt. My, yeah. My takeaway, and I, we're going to go to Matt right now, but my takeaway from that is that if 2030 is your preoccupation, we're still going to have a mix of zero and other technologies for that. So we can't rely entirely on zero between now and 2030, but we can begin to expect 100% zero around 2035. Yeah, and for the entire market, I, I think unfortunately that's true. We're not gonna be able to get to 100% penetration by 2030. But you know, going back to that beachhead diagram I had, I think there are some uh, applications that could get there a lot faster and maybe we could get there by 2030 with some of these. Um, okay. You know, medium duty delivery vans is a great example. All these last mile deliveries that are happening and the increases in the consumer uh, shipping and, and 
and purchases uh, the the new the new the new modes of getting the consumer goods to homes. These zero emission uh, vehicles, I think they're they're almost there. Cost parity and manufacturing, uh, we're seeing a significant increase in what kind of vehicles are offered uh, for zero emission applications in that specific uh, segment. Well, Matt, thank you, Kevin. Yep. Very Sorry, fun. Matt. I think I went over your time. So Is that's uh, fine. I can speak really fast. Well, no, we 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 don't have a hard stop at at two o'clock. Um, I'll say what you need to say. Um, you might have a hard stop at two o'clock. Um, so where are we now? Where do we want to go and how do we get there is really the big question, especially if 2030, 2031 are like you know, splash down targets. You know, pe some people say zero only, which is battery and hydrogen. Others say it's got to be a mix. Um, what do you say? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Denny and Move LA for inviting the South Coast to participate. Um, and thank you for putting me at the last, at the end of the panel, because then I get to react to all of the, you know, the, the salient exactly. comments that were made before uh, and have great respect for everyone on the panel. Um, and let me just put into context the lens that we see things uh, and uh, from the South Coast Air Quality Management District perspective. So, you know, just by way of background, we are the largest air district in the nation, right? So almost 50% of the entire uh, population of California resides within our region of the LA, Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. Uh, as Marvin and others had noted, um, Madeline had, had mentioned it, 40% of all the cargo that's imported into the nation comes through our two ports of LA and Long Beach. So it's the largest uh, gateway in the, the country, but also the sixth largest in the nation. So we've got lots of goods that are coming over from Asia coming in through our two ports. Uh, but unfortunately, as Marvin and, and had also noticed, and, and Chris, that uh, the communities that are impacted are the ones that are near in and around the ports and the transportation of goods movement throughout our region and then to the rest of the country. So that's just, you know, an unacceptable health uh, problem that we face at the, the Air District that Mark also pointed out. Um, but Denny, I want to put into context your the, the dates, right? So you mentioned 2030. Uh, and uh, 2030 for a GHG kind of um, uh, splashdown, as you mentioned. Let me put it into context. We have a 2023 deadline by the federal government to come into attainment with the clean air standards, right? So that's 2023 is just two years away. And then we also have a 2031 uh, deadline for, uh, again, reducing those emissions from NOx. Uh, and as uh, Madeline pointed out, we've got uh, it's on-road trucks, uh, today, off-road equipment, and then marine vessels are the top three categories. Then you also have locomotives. Uh, and then as you go down the list, you get to stationary sources. But those three big NOx drivers for ozone and smog pollution in our region are due to conventional diesel technologies. And most of those are associated with the goods movement sector, right? So 2023 and 2031, we've got to reduce emissions. And it turns out almost 50%. Um, so those are the dates that are driving us, Denny. So right around the corner, uh, we've got to reduce emissions. And to put in a further context, we have, let's say, uh, there's a 2023 also deadline for the CARB truck and bus roll, where every 2010, comp every truck in California has to be 2010 compliant, which means everything that is uh, older than 2010, you can't register at the DMV. And so those things have to be turned over. We'd love to see those turned over to a cleaner technology, not just a 2010 diesel standard. Uh, and in order to do that, we probably have to incentivize, as Marvin noted, these independent owner operators cannot afford new trucks on their own. And they sure as heck can't afford a battery electric truck that costs four times more than a, a conventional truck. So at the port, there's about 7,000 trucks that have to be turned over by 2020 uh, into 2022. In, in the entire basin, there's about 35,000 to 40,000 trucks. So that's the scale that we're talking about in the near term, right? And I don't, um, I have a plot that might help kind of put that into context. I don't know if you have that, Denny, or you want me to show it? Um, I do have it. Um, if you can show it, you probably have it. Okay, let me put that up. So this is a plot that is, um, it's actually by the, the California Air Resources Board. It's a mobile source strategy plot. Uh, and it shows kind of the timeline and the vision of the inventory changing from 2010 certified or diesel to you know uh, zero emissions. And as Kevin mentioned, the trifecta where you've got you know fleets, zero emission technologies. But you can see you know 
it's predominantly diesel until you get to you know almost 2029 20, and 2030. Um, and from our perspective, as uh, as uh, Mark was mentioning, diesel uh, diesel emissions is a carcinogen and it's detrimental to public health. And this is just not acceptable for us. And so what we would love to do is not fight our you know our our EJ brothers and sisters and the community folks is we don't want to pit one technology versus another. We just want to get rid of diesel trucks on the road. And I just want to give a shout out to Commissioner Weissman who, who was in the um, uh, in the audience on the bold uh, activities they did at the Port of Long Beach where they did uh, incentivize folks turning over their diesel uh, trucks to near zero natural gas. Um, because we don't want to have that curve continue where you've got diesel trucks uh, again, proliferating and have a you know 10 to 20 year lifetime in and around our community. So let's get to a cleaner technology. That that's where we're coming from. Um, uh, and then let me just speak to what Kevin had mentioned with the beachheads uh, and the the maturity of the technology and the volumes. We're working with all the major manufacturers on electric trucks. Right, seven years ago, you couldn't you know Daimler and Freightliner just patted us on the head and said, oh how cute a little local district wants electric trucks. Now we're working with them to deploy class eight, uh, you know, product ready, manufacturing line ready, commercial trucks that pull containers out of the ports. We're working with Daimler, we're working with Volvo. Uh, and by their own admission in the next two to five years, the production volumes will be in the low hundreds as Kevin mentioned, right? So if you look at what Kevin said independently, what I'm, I'm verifying and the what ARB showed on that plot, we wanna see zero emission technologies more than anyone else but it's just not going to be in the volumes that are necessary to move the needle in terms of getting public health and diesels off the road. And so our solution is let's get a, a commercially available technology that reduces all those harmful emissions uh, out of our communities. And let's put in a technology that is cleaner. And when zero emissions are available at a cost effective clip, we will spin 180 degrees and provide every resource that we have to incentivize those. But currently, they're just not available. I mean, you know, I, I agree with, I think Madeline and Marvin both said it. We prefer zero. So do we. But the fact is that they're just not available in large quantities. And so well, let's do the next best enough? thing. Are we pushing hard enough? Uh, there's just certain things, you know, even if you throw a ton of money at it, you're still not going to move the needle because, you know, as you're working with uh, moving up the, uh, the the commercialization curve, as it were, these demo, these manufacturers have to go through beta testing. They have to have the warranties in place. They've got to get their dealership network established. They've got to have all of these things in place to ensure that they have a successful product launch, right? And then you've got to have demand from the fleets. And the only way they get uh, to be placing orders is that they have a comfort level of the technology, right? And that is, that's ongoing now. There's no doubt that's happening now. It's just, do we have that in the, the uh, sufficient volumes that we need to ensure that we're making progress toward our federal deadlines? Uh, we will we will support zero emission trucks as they come out today, but you can buy three you know near zero natural gas trucks today for the price of one zero emission truck. So what would you rather have? I mean, we're, we're going to do both, but you know, in order to get to our attainment uh, goals, we really need to start replacing those diesel trucks as soon as possible. So Matt, what would you say to people who say that natural gas methane is uh, yes, it's cleaner than diesel is, may, much cleaner maybe when it's burnt but it's a powerful climate forcer. You know, and I, I don't doubt it, right? I think those are things that have to be addressed, but um, we are, uh, I, I think there's ways to address it. I know there's folks that don't agree that renewable natural gas plays a role. We think it does. Uh, we think it, um, the majority of fleets that are signing up now for natural gas engines are having long-term contracts for renewable. Um, so, and, it, and it, we don't think it's an either or. You, you don't have to fight about getting zero infrastructure in place today because we're working on that as well. We see the pathway, we see the future. It has to be these zero emission technologies. But in the interim, do we have to wait for the perfect? Why can't we clean up the air today with the technology that we have, right? And we'll put in place requirements that, you know, that we don't have to, the government won't have to pay. Public monies won't be used for infrastructure. Public monies don't have to be used for uh, fueling for these natural gas trucks, but let's clean up the air in the communities that need it the most. All right. So um, looking at the 2030 targets, I know you, your agency is primarily dealing with air pollution. 
but you do have some responsibilities with respect to climate, right? So we don't have is, a no, we don't have a legal mandate with climate, but we understand that it's an important uh, co-benefit, right? So we look for opportunities to get both criteria pollutant emissions, toxic emissions, and then climate change emissions. So when you're targeting your 2031 target for meeting the Federal Clean Air Act, and by the way, you should tell us what the penalties are for failure or what they could be. Um, you know, well, you mentioned it, Denny. The, 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 the nightmare scenario is that the federal government comes in and actually implements a federal implementation plan, plan where they tell us, the region, uh, how to get to clean air. Uh, one of the big things is there's going to be a, a two for one emissions offset. That means any new business, if they want to come in, they're going to have to get twice the emissions uh, reductions as, as uh, they emit. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, there's a withholding of transportation funds, right? So that's no more highway funds and no more transportation funds that, you know, there's a, that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. And so the, the consequences are pretty severe. I think there's a lot of naysayers or believer, uh, folks out there that don't believe it's actually going to happen. Uh, but is that a risk that we want to take? And in, in meanwhile, where these communities that are, uh, you know, have diesel trucks running through their neighborhoods, um, do we want to subject them to, you know, waiting for the feds to take over? I just, you know, we think there's a better solution. So if you had... Um an opportunity to offer guidance to people who were thinking about um, um, putting before voters a load of money for um, incentives and investments in clean air and clean climate. Um, from what you're seeing in the technology and in the programming and what have you, what do you think the best way to formulate that program would be? Yeah, I, I, uh... Unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of looking out past 2031, right? So in terms of how those funds are spent in the uh, uh, strategically, I know that we at the district are looking at, we're laser focused in 2023 when our federal attainment is in 2031. Uh, and the way we see funds that could be most effective is if we um, accelerate the, the conventional fleet turnover from diesel to cleaner technologies. Right. I think Madeline said something similar. Let, let let's let's get emission reductions immediately where we can. You know, we agree with Kevin. There's a the parcel delivery, medium duty, those can be electrified right away. The class eight heavy duty, it's going to take a few more years. And we can work on that. But in the interim, let's not wait. Let's let's, you know, let's incentivize uh, the turnover of those conventional diesel technologies, be it on-road, off-road, marine vessels, locos. That's that's what we want to do. Um, the challenge, I think, is. How do you get to the independent owner operators, the smaller guys? They're not going to buy, uh, they weren't going to buy a brand new vehicle anyway. So how do we stack incentive funds to allow them to access uh, cleaner technologies? That I think is going to be one of the major changes the state's going to have to make to their incentive programs. All right, so when you say incentivize turnover of diesel to cleaner technologies, you're referring to near zero emission technologies? Currently- there range of choices there? There, there are. But they, they come at a, you know, you and Kevin mentioned there's a duty cycle component, you know, does, does the technology fit your duty cycle? There's a cost component. There's an infrastructure component. I think Kevin mentioned a trifecta or a quadruple effecta. There's these challenges associated with all of those, right? So, yeah, we would want to incentivize replacement of diesel with the technology that makes the most sense. That's affordable, cost effective that we can get these folks into. But in the, for class eight, uh, heavy duty trucks, the current technology uh, is near zero natural gas, 90% well, clear. Does, let, me, let me offer a kind of a formulation of a policy um, and tell me whether you think it makes sense. Um, we had a boatload of money. Uh, that what we should be doing is um, providing both infrastructure and incentives to every available zero emission option. Um, and where there aren't sufficient to use the resources, um, use that for the cleanest renewable alternative. Uh, so being a engineer, I can see a lot of problems with that, but uh, in general, <laughs> yes. And I think ARB said the same thing, electrify where you can and where you can't get the cleanest available option. The challenge that you face is do you want to get 
a you know four hundred thousand dollar one electric truck, or do you want to buy four you know incentivize four other uh, technology trucks? And so those are the decisions that have to be made. And I would just say let the local air districts decide how to best use those funds because we will make those funds go the furthest. All right. So I use the expression cleanest available renewable technology. So that That's fine. Stri- is that is there sufficient resources to do that if we were to start today? Yeah, I don't I don't see an issue with if you're talking about natural gas, I don't see an issue with that. I think most of the fuel providers are doing renewable natural gas anyway. Uh, but I would also say, you know, are, are you going to require that of the electrons as well? So if it's a if it's consistently across the board and it doesn't increase the cost significantly to the end user, why not? Well, I mean, they are requiring um, in the in the grid. There's an RPS that forces uh, right. the the power providers to shift toward renewable. Yeah, but that's a thirty percent to fifty percent, whatever the RPS is currently going to be. But and but you're going to require one hundred percent renewable natural gas. It just doesn't seem consistent. But you know, that's not our call. Uh, we just want to get whatever comes out of the tailpipe to be the cleanest available. So, do you think a rational thing might be a pipeline rule like the grid rule that would require a, an ever increasing share of the pipeline to be renewable? Yeah, I would. I don't want to comment on fuel policy, especially as it, since it doesn't really relate to uh, uh, criteria pollutant emissions. We would have to look at it. What is the impact on emissions in the basin and uh, into our communities? So, so you're not. The issue of renewable versus non-renewable gas is not really the issue you um, focus on. It's only an issue if it prevents us from deploying cleaner technologies. I see. Okay, so um, thank you, Matt. Is there anything more that you would want to add uh, to this discussion that you've heard? Do you think we can make it 2031 and 2030 with what we know and have if we adopt the rules and invest the money? Are you asking me or everybody? (laughs) I'm asking you, Matt, right now. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I agree 100% with what Mark Carroll said. It takes money and it takes political will. And uh, if we have uh, both of those in abundance, yes, we will meet our 2031 deadline. And and perhaps our 2030 target for IPCC? Yes. Well, I'm going to go home and uh, I'm having dinner with my 25 year old son tonight. Um, and every every night, every week we have dinner and I have to give him an update. Um, about uh, You know, wh- what do I think the chances are that we'll make that 2030 deadline? And I'm going to be able to give him a, a more rosy, uh, op- optimistic picture tonight. I'm just surprised that uh, your son asked you about that. <laughs> Oh, listen, on the, on, on the night that Donald Trump became president, he was flipping out because the whole, whole prospect of a rollback of federal effort on climate was really uh, an upsetting prospect. So I think the younger generation out there is very, very attuned to the issue of how we move climate forward. So listen, I want to thank all of our panelists. We're a little over our time. Um, I think it's been a very effective and valuable discussion. Like I told you, we will be making this available to many, many, many more people than those who showed up in our audience today so that it's a resource going forward. And I think the kind of dialogue that we have among really experts like we had today is just the kind of dialogue we need to have to sort through this uh, effectively. And thank you very, very much, all of you for attending. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Move Thanks, everyone. Say hello to my Thank friends you. in the Empire, Norman. Yeah, come, come out and see us. <laughs>